Hi, this is John Wellman, Associate Pastor at Calvary Baptist Church. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video message from Calvary today. If videos like this are a blessing to you, would you consider giving financially back to Calvary so that we can continue to make videos like this available, getting the gospel to the ends of the earth by any means necessary? Simply go to calvaryelco.org, click on the giving tab, and any donation of any size would be very much appreciated. Thank you and God bless. Speak to our hearts, Father. Man, we need you like we've never needed you before. We want to be used to carry out your will in this world. So teach us, Father, from your word what that really means. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. So we've been talking about the fact that all around us, you're going to see God at work. God is working in our world today. And... Um, because he loves us as his children, he's going to take the initiative and he's going to come and invite us to work with him, to be a part of what he's doing. And when we see God at work, that becomes your invitation to join him in that work. When God reveals to you a way in which he's working, that's your invitation to join him in, in what he's doing. And uh, so God speaks to us, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, through the Holy Spirit in the Bible, through prayer, through circumstances, and through the church, the, the family of God. But here's the deal, when God invites us to join him in his work, that is going to create for us what I would call a crisis of belief. That's going to require faith on our part and action on our part. And, and when I say Christ of belief, what do I mean by that? Well, <clears throat> the word crisis in the, in the Greek language is a word that just means decision. It means judgment. It, it means a point where a, deci a decision needs to be made, where you need to decide. And so the Christ of belief that I'm talking about is that turning point <clears throat> where you have to make a decision. God has called me to work in this area. God is speaking to me and he wants me to, to be involved with him and what he's doing here. I have to make the decision. Am I going to believe God and am I going to join him in what he's doing? You've got to decide at that point, what is it that you believe about God? See, how you respond when you come to that decision point really is going to determine whether you're going to go on with God and God is going to work through you to do what I would call a God-sized assignment or whether you're going to turn away and, and say, well, that, he's not talking to me. And you're going to miss out on a, on a purpose that he has for your life. And what I want you to understand is this Christ's of belief isn't a one-time event in your life. It really becomes almost a daily kind of thing. Where every day you have to decide, is God speaking to me in this situation? And am I going to join him? Do I believe that he's calling me? Am I going to get involved in it? You know, each day I've got to decide, am I going to believe God? Am I going to trust that he is leading? And am I going, and am I, and am I going to join him in that work? Because folks, we can talk about trust in God all day long. But talk is cheap, folks. It's what we do that really gives evidence to our faith. Uh, how you live is testimony of what you believe. I, I think, for instance, about those people who are walking around Jericho in the Old Testament. Now, I imagine that some of them really had some questions about this. What are we doing out here? We've been walking around this city for four and five and six days. What's going on here? But others understood that this was what God wanted them to do. And they believed that God was going to work supernaturally. And so they're out there walking. Their actions are showing what they believe about God. That God has led them to that point And God's going to do something through them. I think about Gideon. Here's Gideon. And uh, the story in, in Judges, the picture there, is just priceless. Here is Gideon. And he's threshing wheat, hiding in a wine press. Wine press, you know, there's a wall all around it. And he's hiding down there, hiding from the Midianite army. And an angel of the Lord shows up and he says, 
Hail, almighty warrior. Now that's an, almost an oxymoron. He's hiding for his life and he's called a mighty warrior. But anyway, God says, I want you to deliver the nation of Israel from the Midianite army. And so, you know, Gideon gathers his forces together and God says, you got too many men here. And so he pairs it down and sends home those who are scared and those who, you know, and he's still got too many men. And finally God says, okay, you've got 300 men left. I want you to go fight the, the thousands of the Midianites. Gideon went. His actions spoke of his faith, of his, of his trust in God. And so I want us to look this morning at three critical truths when it comes to trusting God when God speaks to us, when God invites us into his work. And the first of these is simply this, that an encounter with God requires faith. An encounter with God requires faith. Remember, God is at work around us and he invites us to join him in what he's doing. <clears throat> and what you do in response to God's revelation, that is his invitation, reveals what you believe about God. For instance, if you believe that, well, God could never use me. I don't have talents. I don't have abilities. God could never use me. Then when God speaks to you, you're going to just say, well, that must be the effects of indigestion from the pizza I ate last night or whatever, you know. It couldn't be God speaking to me. But if you're centered in God and not in yourself, when God speaks, that you're going to believe that God is speaking to you and you'll respond in surrender to his will and join him in what he wants you to do and carry out. So you see, true faith requires action. Um, when God speaks, your response requires faith. You see that over and over in Scripture. I mean, Noah pulled out the hammer and the saw. Abraham started packing his bags to move to the land of promise. Moses returned back to Pharaoh, to, uh, back to Egypt, where Pharaoh had threatened his life and said, I'm going to kill you. Everywhere you look, when God reveals himself, his purpose and his ways, people had to respond in faith. It requires faith from us. Now, let's stop right there and let's ask the question, what is faith? What is faith? Well, a great definition of faith is found in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Look at this verse. <clears throat> it says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. Now that's a great definition of faith. I mean, faith is the confidence that what God has promised or what God has said will come to pass. I mean, for instance, Abraham. Um, God came to Abraham and, and God says, I'm going to make a great nation of you. And Abraham believed him. Abraham trusted him. Even though circumstances looked like that couldn't happen. Not only did they not look like they're going to happen, but for years and decades, God never fulfilled his word. And yet look what Paul says in Romans chapter 4 and verse 20 and 21. He says, Abraham never wavered in belief in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. God had said, I promise you, you're going to have a son and he will be a great nation. Abraham never wavered in that. Look at it in verse 21. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. That's what faith is. That God has promised, and I truly believe, I'm confident that he will carry out what he's promised. See, the truth of the matter is that when God speaks to us, our trust and surrender to him and, and his power is far greater than any confidence we put in ourselves or in our own abilities to, to do something for God. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we live by faith. And not by sight. It's not what I can do. But it's what God can do. Now, I don't want you to misinterpret this, this, uh, this verse, uh, Hebrews 11.1. 1. 
one of the key things that you need to recognize is that our faith is in a person. Our faith is in a person. It's not in some kind of concept or, or some kind of idea. Faith must be in a person, and that's in God himself. I mean, um, you see, what we're not talking about is for you to come up with some idea or me to come up with some idea or, or someone else decide that, boy, this is something I really wish would happen or I'd like for it to happen. And so I just want you to believe that this is going to happen. So that's not faith. If that's the kind of faith you have, you're in a dangerous place to say, well, I just am going to believe that, that this is going to happen in my life. We don't put our faith in a thing. We put our faith in God, in a person God. It, it's what God says. <clears throat> That's when faith is valid. Not in what you say or what you hope is going to happen or what you expect to happen. Faith is only valid in God and in what he is purposing to do. You see, if, if we put our faith in what we want, then what is it? We're dependent on what we can do, right? Uh, God has nothing to do with that. I don't need God. If, if I'm going to, this is what I want to happen. I'm going to get it to accomplish. God has no part in that. It's all up to us. I don't know about you, but if I put my hope in what I can do, then what I end up with is what I can do. You know, and uh, folks, I'm kind of limited if my faith is in God, God can do all things. There's nothing impossible with God. With me, there's a lot of things that are impossible, okay? So I'm not going to put my faith in me. I want to put it in God. Take Moses, for example. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> God was going to use Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of captivity in Egypt. And if Moses had just depended on himself... One man could have never faced up to the whole Egyptian army, could he have? Uh, if Moses depended on himself, he would have never been able to, to get those people across the Red Sea. If Moses had only depended on himself, he would not have been able to provide water in the wilderness out of a rock. He would never have, have been able to provide manna and quail to eat when they, were, when they were hungry. He had to always depend on God. He had to have the faith in God who called him and said, God, I'm going to, uh, Moses, I'm going to use you to deliver the people and you can count on my help in this. Or, or think about Joshua. If Joshua had just depended on himself, he would have never been able to take the Israelites across the Jordan River. He would have never been able to pull down walled cities. He would have never been able to uh, defeat the enemies. He would have never been able to make the sun stand still. That was all of God. God had to do that. And so Joshua had to have faith in a person, in God himself. See, the truth is, when God invites us to join him in his work, and, and he wants to work through us, it's going to be something that God can do. It's going to be something that only God can do. It's not me, but God. You see, what we believe about God will determine what we will do. If we have faith in God who calls us, we will obey him and he'll accomplish his work through us. But if we lack faith, then we're going to end up not doing what God wants us to do. And folks, that's disobedience. God says, I want you to do this. And you and I say, well, I'd rather do this. We're being disobedient to God. And even if, if we say, well, let me just wait, God. Let me just check this out. I'm going to wait and see if this is really you. Folks, delayed obedience is really d disobedience. <clears throat> Realize that. <clears throat> so when God calls us to join him in a God-sized task, faith is required. And our obedience to God's initiative is going to show our faith. But here's the problem. We're all self-centered. We, we all have this major problem. We think that we have to accomplish God's will in our own power and with our own resources, okay? What we forget is that when God speaks, he always reveals what he wants to do. And what he wants to do will always have God's resources behind it. So we join him in what he wants to do, and then God works through us, and he provides everything that we need 
to do what he's called us to do. So we don't have to be able to accomplish the task with our limited ability or our limited resources. No, with faith, we proceed confidently to obey him because we know that he is the one that's going to bring pass to pass what will bring him glory. Remember what Jesus said in, in Mark 10, 27? Uh, Jesus looked at him intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. That's pretty much where most of us live, okay? Humanly speaking. But he goes on, he says, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. See, when God calls us to do something and shows us this is what I want to accomplish, God is going to bring his power into play and his resources into play so that that can be accomplished. Back in, in 1989, I was a bivocational pastor at a, a church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, Hickory Hills Baptist Church, and it was a brand new church. It was a church start. And... Um, we probably ran anywhere from 25 to 35, maybe 40 on a good Sunday. It was a small congregation. We met in a school. You know, we set up every Sunday. You'd bring in the chairs from the trailer and we'd set them up and we'd hold for a church. But God spoke to us one day to say, you need to let this community know that this church is here. And he began to place ideas into our mind of things that there was absolutely no way that our group of 25 or 30 or 35 people would ever be able to accomplish. He says, I want you to reach this community and let them know that you're here. And so God led us to put on a community-wide Christmas celebration, an area of maybe five, 600 homes and we were going to, you know, 20, 35 people were going to make an impact on that many homes. And God began to open doors and began to provide for us and give us new ideas. And we put on this, this elaborate Christmas program with music and drama and all of that, our, our little group. We had over 200 people who showed up. That was something only God could do. We couldn't have pulled that off in and of ourselves. And so the truth of the matter is that when God speaks, God provides. When you encounter God, it's going to bring a crisis of belief. And that crisis is going to call you, call for faith. And without that faith, you're not going to please God. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. So first of all, anytime that you have an encounter with God, it's going to require faith. But second... <coughs> An encounter with God is always God-sized, supersized, okay? All right. Uh, if you've been attending over the last uh, two months, you know that we're kind of engaged in an emphasis called who's your one. And that's challenging all of us to let our friends and family and co-workers in Elko and Spring Creek, uh, let them know about the good news of Jesus Christ and, and his salvation th that he offers. I mean, we want people throughout this community to know Jesus Christ uh, and to come to know him. But friends, the only way that people will know what God is like is if they see God at work. You and I can talk till we're blue in the face about who God is and what God is like. But people will only come to know his nature when they see God's nature expressed in his activity. And so because of that, whatever God, whenever God involves you in his activity, the assignment will have a God-sized proportion to it. Because God wants to be seen as being great and mighty and holy. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, God will never ask me to do something that uh, I can't do. God would never ask me to do something I can't do. You're totally wrong. You're totally wrong. In fact, if God is giving me assignment that I can handle on my own, that you can handle on your own, that's pretty good evidence that that's really not God's assignment. That's a good idea that you had, and you're going to do that, and it, you know, it'd be, be nice. But when the God gives you assignment, they're always God-sized. So that his nature and his strength and his provision and his kindness will be evident to the watching world. 
Um, folks, there's, there's only one way the world will ever come to know God and his might. And that is when God does something mighty in our midst. What do I mean by God-sized assignments? Well, there are a lot of God-sized assignments in Scripture. Um, Abraham, of course, we've mentioned him, was called to be a father of a nation when he had no son and his wife, Sarah, was well beyond childbearing years. I mean, remember how old was Sarah when Isaac was born? She was 90 years old. How many of you know 90-year-old women who are giving birth to children these days? You know, that was a God-sized thing that happened. Abraham was 100 years old. Uh, think about Moses. He was told to deliver the people, and God's power had to be evident in it. Because the only way to get across the Red Sea that Moses knew was to spend two weeks holding off the Egyptian army while they built barges and boats to get across. But God came along and he parted the Red Sea and they walked across on dry land. He provided water in the wilderness out of a rock. Moses didn't have the ability to get water out of that rock. He didn't have drilling equipment and blasting equipment or anything to, to, to build a well right there. Uh, he provided water out of a rock. Look at, at Gideon. Gideon only had 300 men. And you know what, folks? They were not even instructed to carry weapons with them. They took a pitcher, they took a, a lantern, I mean a, a torch, and they took a trumpet. And they defeated the Midian army with those instruments. That was a God-sized assignment. Uh, remember over in, in Matthew chapter 14, the story of the feeding of the 5,000? The disciples said this, look at Matthew 14, 15, and 16. He says, this is a remote place. These are the disciples talking to Jesus. This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. And you remember what Jesus said to them? Look at verse 16. That isn't necessary. You feed them. You feed them. That, my friends, is a God-sized assignment because the disciples knew they couldn't feed that many people. Oh, well, there's no way we can do it. In fact, uh, they said this, that there's no way we can do this. All we've got is five loaves of bread and two fishes. We can't do this. But then God got involved. And, and Jesus divided those loaves and fishes and he fed 5,000 men and women. Well, it's actually... If you look at the story, who was it that fed the 5,000? It was the disciples. They distributed it. It's because they allowed God to be the power source behind it. And he divided those fish and those loaves. And the disciples were able to carry out the God-sized assignment that was given to them to feed the masses. Now, I want you to listen to this because this is real important. I just want to be honest with you, okay? Uh, let's just have a real frank assessment of where we are as a church, okay? What our world often is seeing today is Christians who are devoted and committed to serving God. But what we're not seeing very much of is we're not seeing God. We're seeing Christians doing really nice things and wonderful things, but we're not seeing God. I mean, and, and the People out there are commenting, you know, those people at Calvary Baptist Church, oh, they're so wonderful, they're so dedicated, they're so committed to people, they're just serving God. But they're not seeing God. In many ways, churches today are not much different than the Kiwanis Club or the Lions Club. Good people doing a lot of good things. Folks are not seeing God. Not seeing God in his might. Because we're not attempting to do things that only God can do. Um, they're seeing us doing some nice things. But are they seeing God working through us? I mean, too often we hatch up our ideas and we set out to, to do some things. And maybe we'll come along and we'll ask God to bless what we're doing. Uh, but again, how often those plans are our plans? 
and not plans that God is doing and inviting us to be a part of. Folks, our world is not attracted to Jesus Christ that we serve because, frankly, they don't see him at work in, in what we're doing. Uh, they see us doing good things for God, and, and, and they respond, well, that's wonderful, but you know what? That's just not my thing. Uh, folks, the world is passing us by because they don't want to get involved in what they're seeing. They're not having the opportunity to see God. If we were to let the world see God at work through us, God would attract people to himself through us. Christ would be lifted up. And, and not just in our words that we preach Christ, but they would see it in our lives, in our actions. They would see the difference that a living Christ is making in our families and in our businesses and in, in our church. And that would make a huge difference. And, and so when Spring Creek and Elko see things happening in our church that can only be explained because God is doing them, then God will be glorified and God will be lifted up and they'll be drawn to God. Um, let me share with you an illustration that Henry Blackaby gives in his book, Experiencing God, that <clears throat> really shows how God's miraculous working attracts people and gives glory to himself. Um, when Blackaby was pastoring in uh, Saskatoon, Canada, the church reached a point where they needed more building space. The church was growing, but they needed more space. And so uh, they, they felt God was leading them to start a building program. Even though we only had, only had $749 in their building fund, okay? And they determined that the building that they needed, and of course this was back in the 1970s, okay? They needed a building that was going to cost them about $220,000. And they had $749 in the bank. But they felt that this was God's leadership and that God would would lead them and God would work through them to accomplish what, what, uh, what they needed to do because they didn't have the foggiest notion as to how they were going to do that. So first of all, <clears throat> they decided that to save labor costs, they would do as much of the work that they could do themselves. They would, they would do that. And even then, they found themselves about $100,000 short. Uh, Blackaby related this truth. He says, these dear people look to their pastor to see if I believe that God would do what he called us to do. And, and he says, God put a confidence in my heart that the God who was leading us would show us how to do this. And so God began to provide funds for them. There were gifts coming from churches in the United States and so forth. But when it was all said and done, they were still $60,000 short. And uh, they'd been expecting some money from a foundation in Texas. But for one reason or another, it was delayed. And then it was delayed again. And then it was delayed again. And they couldn't figure out why was this being delayed. And then God's miracle happened. On one particular day, for just two hours on that particular day, the currency exchange rate between the United States and Canada fell to its lowest point in history. And at that very time, the money from Texas was transferred to Canada. And they suddenly found that they had $60,000 more than they were expecting. And once that wire, that money was transferred, the currency rate went back up. Blackaby says... Does the Heavenly Father look after the economy in order to help his children? Absolutely. Absolutely. See, and, and as a result of that, God was magnified in the eyes of the people in that community. They knew that was a God thing. And he was glorified and people came to know him as Savior and Lord. Uh, they credited to God because God had said, this is my assignment Trust me, act in faith, get to building that building, and watch what I do. So an encounter with God is always going to be God-sized. Third, <clears throat> our reaction to encountering God really reveals what we believe about God. Our reaction to encountering, 
Encountering God reveals what we believe about God. See, when God speaks to a person or to a church, revealing his plans, his purposes, it's always going to create this crisis of belief. And so what we do in response to God's revelation really reveals what we believe about God, regardless of what we say. I mean, we can talk all day long about how we trust God, how we believe God, how we love God. We can repeat it over and over again. My faith is in God, and that's all well and good. But what we believe will always be demonstrated by our actions. That's what the writer of, of James said, the epistle of James. Look at chapter 2 and verse 14 and then verse 26. He says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Verse 26, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. What we believe is seen in what we do. Uh, look at the example of, of Paul, I, I mean, of David, <clears throat> of David. Over in, in 1 Samuel 16, we see the prophet Samuel coming and, and anointing David in kind of a private hush-hush ceremony, anointing him as the next king of Israel. In the next chapter, God invites David to get involved in what he's doing to deliver the people out of, the, out of bondage to the Philistines. And, and you know the story. David is a young lad. His brothers are off with the Israeli army. They're fighting against the Philistines. And David's father sends David to see his brothers to take them some food supplies. And when he shows up, all the Israeli army and the Philistine army are on the other side. And in the middle is this giant of a man called Goliath. And Goliath is pacing back and forth and he's taunting the Israelites. And, and he's saying, who's going to fight me? Send your man out. Send your champion out and we will fight. And if he beats me, we'll be your slaves for life. But if I beat him, then you all will be our slaves for life. And the Israelites were terrified. And David's kind of wandering around and he's saying, why are you letting this pagan taunt the God of heaven? Why are you letting him speak such blasphemy against our God? God is able to deliver this. And, and it, what you see is that David makes an expression of faith. He declares that God can deliver us. In fact, his words were these. He said, let me find it here. He says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hands of this Philistine. Um, and so it was because of David's faith. His next action was to join God in what he was doing to bring about the deliverance of, of Israel. Look at uh, 1 Samuel 17, beginning of verse 45. It says, David replied to the Philistine, that is to Goliath, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's army, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead, uh, the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals. And look at this, the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, not with sword or spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. See, David's statements and then his actions indicated that he believed that God was a living God and that God would deliver his people. And so through David, God did deliver Israel. Uh, he delivered Israel in, in a way that we would think, well, he's just using a foolish teenage boy. And yet God got the results. God got the mighty victory. The whole world knew that there was a God in Israel. That's faith in action. Uh, David demonstrated his faith in God through his actions. An opposite picture <clears throat> is also found in the Old Testament. And that's the lack of faith of Sarah, Abraham's wife. We've, we've talked about that. You know, that God had given to Abraham and to Sarah the promise 
that one day he would have a son who would be the father of a great nation. For some reason, Sarah doubted. For some reason, Sarah didn't have the patience to wait on God's timing. And so what does she do? She says, I can handle this on my own. I can figure this out. We'll work this. We don't need God's help in this. Look at Genesis 16 verse 2. So Sarah said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. There's unbelief there. Let's do it my way. God's somewhere God's checked out. I don't know where he is. but We can do it my way. Her unbelief was very, very costly. Because from almost from the beginning, very quickly, there was hostility and jealousy between Sarah and her handmaiden, Hagar. And subsequent history bears witness that even until this day, the descendants of Ishmael, who was the, the you know, Abraham and, and, and Hagar's daughter, uh, son, from Ishmael and Isaac, there's been animosity from that time even until today. It's because her lack of faith, she didn't believe that God could do the miraculous. <clears throat> so Sarah's faith was limited because she used her own human wisdom. She came to a crisis of belief and she failed miserably. What are you going to do in response to God when he shows up and says, I want you to do this for me. I want you involved in this going on. How are you going to act? What, what you do is going to indicate what you really believe about God. So what is God calling you to do that only he can do through you? Um, is he laying on your heart a God-sized assignment that you'd say, I, there's no way I could do that. You know, I think for some of you, this idea of uh, who's your one, it's one thing to take a card and put your, a friend's name on it and say, yeah, I'll pray for this one. I'll, I'll, um, I'll try to share Christ with them during the next 12 months. Uh, some of you just said, that, yeah, that sounds good. I'll do that. You know, everybody else is doing it. Let's put it on the wall out here. And, and so we got the who's your one wall and all that. But the God-sized assignment says that sometime in the next week or two weeks or three weeks or four months or whatever, God's going to open up an opportunity for you to speak the gospel to that person. And some of you are saying, there's no way that I'm going to be able to do that. Yeah, I can pray all day long for that person, but open my mouth and tell them about Jesus Christ. I can't do that. For some of you, that's a God-sized assignment. <clears throat> God's calling you to do that. Are you going to believe that he can do it through you? You've got to take that step of faith. You've got to say, yes, God, I will do it. And when the opportunity comes, open your mouth. And God will do through you something that you will, couldn't even begin to believe that God will let you be a part of that. Um, Praying for Elko. That's a God-sized assignment. This group of people right here and others who are not here this morning, we're going to go out and we're going to cover 15,000 houses in Elko Spring Creek? Ain't no way. But if God calls us to do it, we can do it. We can do it. I got to calculating. Let's say you get you and your partner get an assignment of 200 homes. 200 homes? There's no way I can do that. You can do two homes a minute. It's going to take you 100 minutes. That's less than two hours. If both of you cover the same side of the street, you can do it in less than an hour. I mean, each side of the street. This is something you can do, and God will be glorified. We're saying to Elko, we want to pray for you. And you know what? When we do, who gets the glory? Not us. This is God. I think of also about this idea of that I really 
feel very strongly, your elders feel very strongly, of starting a church on the south side of this city. That's impossible for us to do. Our budget is not going to supply enough money for a, another minister on staff to work in the south side community. And God says, well, I know that. That's why I want you to depend on me. I want you to be obedient to me. I want you to, to, to take the step of faith and watch what I'm going to do to bring that about in your midst. See, the truth of that is that God is speaking to you right now about something in your life. Maybe it, ladies, it's really beginning to share a witness with your unbelieving husband. And you say, Pastor, you don't know my husband. We've been down that road before, and I don't want to go there again. God says, take that step of faith. Maybe it's to forgive somebody in your life. God says, you need to do this. And you say, uh, -uh. you just don't know what they did to me back when. God says, trust me in this. Take that step of faith. I don't know what God is saying to you, but I know that God wants to work in every single person's life in this room. And when, he, when you say yes to God, God will work through you in your life in such an incredible way that it can only be explained because God did it. And then God's going to get the glory. So what is it? that God is speaking to you. I want to just simply say to you this morning, say yes. Just say yes to God. If you'll say yes to God and then fasten your seatbelt, God's going to do something just absolutely remarkable. You will not even begin to imagine what God could do through people who say yes to him. Let's bow for a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, forgive us when we doubt you. Forgive us when we get so comfortable in doing our own little thing here and calling it Christianity. Because the world really doesn't know you through what we're doing. Give us boldness. To step out and act in faith when you show us what you want us to do. Give us your wisdom, your insight. Give us your eyes to see people who need to know you. And then give us the faith to step forward in obedience to you. We want to be used by you to make a difference in this world. In your name we pray.